Good afternoon again, Emme. Good afternoon, Clara. <laughs> how, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, thank you. Well, <laughs> you're putting yourself through something here, huh? <laughs> I, should, I don't know if I'm ready or... <laughs> Well, welcome. This is the first of a series of conversations that um, House of Jelly is having with the artists from the Pan-African diaspora, um, multiple uh, disciplinary artists. So, like I said, you're doing us the honor of being number one. So Awesome. Well, thank you. It's truly an honor on my part, you know. House of Jelly is, is um, it's a beautiful concept and um, I'm, I'm very happy um with what you're doing it's pretty awesome thank you thank you so uh tell us a little bit I, I know a bit about you because last year i had the pleasure of being interviewed by you so you're half of uh, jolly papa right yes yep. you also are a band leader but um Perfect. tell us how it all started you know not necessarily jolly papa but you being a musician a professional musician Sure. Um, you know, as long as I can remember, I've always kind of been into music. Um, the er my, the, my earliest memory is um, as a young preteen, um, growing up amongst my my you know peers, and taking songs from the radio and making my own lyrics out of them. You know. Okay. I, I would, uh, you know, and I would teach my friends and it sort of became like an inside joke. Other people would be singing the actual song and we would start singing our own version. <laughs> and people would be like, oh, what version is that? I never heard that one, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I messed around doing that. And um, at one point, my parents bought me a guitar. Um and then I started messing around with the guitar. I uh, got to the point where I decided, you know, let me try recording myself. And um, at that time, you know, to be honest, I knew about recording studios, but I'd never been to one. I didn't know what it was like and what actually happened there, you know? I just knew that there was a place where people go and record music and all that stuff. So I said, you know, I'm going to do my own thing first. So I got two, you know, those old cassette tapes with the double cassette. Yes. So I got two of those, um, put them like side by side or in front of each other. And I started making music. I would use empty cassette tapes, bang them together as my drum beats, you know, as my, my rhythm and tempo. And then I would, I used my guitar, which at that point had lost some strings <laughs> and I never replaced them. Uh, so I would just, you know, play, thumb some notes. Um, and I did that and I made a song so, out of it. I'm sorry. So this yeah. is back in Nigeria because... Uh, this is back in Nigeria, yeah. Really? Yeah. And your parents were okay with that? We know how some of African parents can be when it comes to careers in the arts. Yours no, were they, okay? They, they just thought I was messing around, you know? It was okay. summertime, vacation, boarding, and I was in boarding school. So summertime, vacation, I locked myself in my room. You know, we, all, we lived in this kind of situation where when you grow up back home, you kind of move out of your baby room. Yes. You know, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> I moved out of the, my baby room. I moved into a, you know, more mature room uh, downstairs, big boy room. Big boy room. Right. And um, so I would lock myself in there and I was messing around with sounds and concepts. And then, you know, well, a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you take what you recorded to a recording studio? You never know. So I did. I took it to a recording studio. The guy listened, he's like, hmm. I can tell you did this at home. I said, yeah. It's like, hmm, very interesting. You have very serious potential. I said, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, he gave me an idea of how to improve the next one and to write better and, um, and all that. So make a long story short, I, you know, that concept never left my mind. You know, the idea that, you know, 
you could actually make music from concept all the way to a, a product, something that somebody else would listen to. Mm -hmm. And that particular first song I did, I, I, my sister still sings the song. Well, as of a few years ago, she still remembered the song. And it was, it was very interesting because um, that became sort of my calling card, but it stayed on my mind. And as soon as I, I could, to be honest, I went and I took a course in recording engineering. And, you know, I aced the course with a bunch of other students. We're all graded. I aced the course and it made me feel a little bit more confident. And um, then I started thinking about a band playing with other people. So if I may interject. Uh, sure. So you, it's, you essentially taught yourself how to uh, play the guitar and how to put instruments together and how all the sounding stuff i don't know the technical terms but sure. all of that in order to arrive to the point where you decide oh now it's time to be in a band yeah essentially yeah okay i i, I kind of played around you know as a young man you got more time than you know you know what to do with it in some cases. And I was trying not to run the streets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so music was it, huh? Yeah, music really helped me. And, you know, right from childhood, I really listened to instrumentation. I was fascinated by instrumentation. Like, how did they know to put the horn line right there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, have the vocals here. And, you know, that fascinated me. And I spent a lot of time listening, and then when I got the chance, I tried to repro reproduce it. Okay. So starting a band became the next challenge, and it was a big challenge, you know. Um, by the time I was fully ready and comfortable to do that, I was in the States at that point, and, um, you know, back home is so much easier to start a band. You just, people come around, they don't really want you to pay. That's not really, you know, that's not the first thing. And, you know, rehearsing and making places to play was not a big deal back home. But here it was, you know. <laughs> it was a, also, what, what are some of the differences? Okay, my first experience playing live was actually back home before I came here. Okay. And it was in a town called Zaria, which is in northern Nigeria. And I was going, I was studying in Zaria. You have a university there. And... Um, it turns out my roommates were musicians, just nothing planned. We're all putting one room together and there's a bass player there, there's a drummer there. I filled it a little bit with the guitar and there was a keyboardist. And we're all four of us were roommates and it was like amazing. So we, we started trying to practice and then we got an opportunity to go perf perform at a spot. We didn't know anything about the place but we knew they had instruments. And, uh, you know, so we said, oh, perfect, let's go. We planned, we took our, our water bottles. We're like, we're gone for the whole day. This is a done deal. We get there and it's a brothel. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, bro it's a okay. brothel bar. <laughs> you know? And uh, strange experience for your first gig. Well, there are customers there, right? There were customers and they were, you know, throwing us money, buying us drinks. And uh, the women would be, yeah, you, you guys are trying, you know. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> so, <yeah>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I went through that. <laughs> so what did you learn from that experience so much so that you could carry that over to... Um, bringing a band together when you've moved to the states sure um the first i think thing that's that stood out was the you know the love you get from from trying you know there's a lot of good vibes you know and if you know anything about nigeria zaria i'm you know east southeastern nigeria zaria is up north totally different culture, mm -hmm. different people. But yeah, the love was there, you know, they were still giving it up. And um, as, as the musical side, 
you know, the, the first, I think I got hooked to playing with people, playing alongside people, being able to listen, uh, being able to allow others play, okay. you know, and it became, uh, you know, actually a particular skill of mine to be able to um, know how to step forward, step back, let other people shine, you know. And in fact, some of my performances to date, you you see me give a piece to the drummer, give some time to the bass player. You know, this is all part of my uh, beginnings. This is how I started listening, you know, and playing. So coming to America was, you know, doing this in America became totally different. Musicians generally don't move unless there is some money involved, you know, and time, making time. So, you know, looking for people who are willing to play along for a period of time uh, before money or before, you know, gigging or other things became part of it was not easy. But we were lucky. My brother and I had a house and we converted the entire basement into a musical room. We just bought equipment. And um, so sometimes people will come and rehearse and we would notice the good players, you know, call them back. You want to do this, you want to do that. So over a period of time, we started to meet people who wanted to play and who wanted to try something. You know, and that's basically how it started. Yeah. Okay. And is this in the in the DC area? Did you start over here? Yes. This was actually in uh, Silver Spring. Okay. Wow. So be, because people have this, um, I don't know if it's a misconception, we should call it, uh, of musician. It's all about glamour. It's rock and roll. It's a big party all the time. Right. 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 right, right, right. What What would you say? about that the misconceptions you know and, and the real life of a musician well the, it, the partying is not a misconception okay. you know yeah musicians can party um but it's not all glamour you know there's you spend a lot of time um in the shop you know working on your timing your general skills with music and you know the ability to play along with others and it, you know that part of it people don't see so you know when they see the musician out on stage dressed well and you know jumping around and all that stuff it looks like hey they just woke up and they're doing it you know but it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of help you know, you need other people to be part of your your career, you know, to inspire you, you know. I remember there was a Haitian brother. He's still around. I still work with him from time to time. Um, his name is uh, Joe Lewis, Fon Fon Joe Lewis. And a friend of his told him about what we were doing in my basement. And he's a phenomenal guitar player. So he's like, he came out one day, he's like, yeah. Let me just come check you guys out. And he sat in with us and blew our minds. I mean, he was so badass on guitar. It was amazing. But, you know, he enjoyed himself. And when he had a chance, he was doing some show. I think it was at Takuma Station right here mm -hmm. in Takuma Park. He asked us to open for his show. And that was huge. That you know, the inspiration we all received from that particular opportunity was tremendous. And, um, you know, he taught me a very important thing, you know, it, people have to be part of your career. It's a collective sport. It's a collective sport. It's really, um, it's, it's a community yeah. in some ways, you know, that people will inspire you musically, People inspire you lyrically. Uh, people inspire you with your ethics, you know, how you conduct yourself as an artist. Um, and, you know, it helped me in the future, you know, after, after that point, some of the things people accuse musicians of doing the partying too much. I had to learn 
after the show, you go home. Because it's, it, it's like having a job, isn't it? So your it job is. is over it and is. you go home. You go home. The people who don't do it properly, I think, are the guys who just overhang. You know, it's that's where you get into all problems, drugs and womanizing and all these other things that can cause anybody problems, not not just because you're a musician. Right. You know? So that that taught me, you know, hanging with those older guys who are a little bit more mature, who played for a while, it taught me, hey, do your job, have fun, you know, have more fun as, as much as you can while doing your job. But when it's done, go home. Yeah. Right. Well, speaking of um, being part of a collective, you, you've been in the DC area for a while now. Right? A while now, yeah. Yes. yes. And so you've had your share of um, sharing the, the podium, if you will, sure. with, with many artists from all over the place. You're doing a radio show. So uh, what are some of the some of the places, because there, I know that there are venues that typically cater to African music and that are sure. now defunct. So sure. where, where are some of the places you've performed and with whom? Oh, sure. Um, wow, there's so many places that are gone. Some of them, I can't even remember their names. But when I started, people used to tell me that there was only one I mean, these are musicians who played around, played a lot of places with lots of different bands. And they used to tell me there was only one other African guy they remember who was playing regularly in DC, playing African music. Not talking about the artists who came in from town, from time to time, but somebody who was based in DC, who was a part of the scene. There's only one other African guy they remember. And I'm like, how can that be? I was like, unfathomable that's not can't be true and then the more i researched and the more i got out the more i realized that you know this is this is an issue for for folks you know to be able to find a venue that will cater to african music mm -hmm. and welcome african guests and do it on a regular basis you know so we did a lot of trial and error we did a lot of one-offs kind of auditions you know and you know i remember there was a place on university boulevard uh right there's a chicken place there now a little shopping center in the back there there used to be an african spot there i was caribbean actually as i recall and they gave us a chance i think we, we gigged there for a few weeks and um then we moved on we said you know we're trying to get into dc because all the action was in DC, you know, 18th Street, U Street, 9th Street. That's where all the activity was going on. And then, you know, after a few years, some African restaurants opened up and more opportunities came. You know, Ethiopian restaurants opened up. There was a place called Ghana Cafe that we performed in quite a, a few times. Um, we did stuff at uh, Bukom. Bukama has been around forever, just so yeah. you know. Um, on 9th Street, right? Is it that's 19th? on 18th, 18th, yeah, 18th Street, yeah. So all these places were, they were cool, but it's not actually what I thought the life, my life as a musician would be, you know. Uh, some of the audiences were not diverse enough, you okay. know. And the interesting thing about the kind of, I play African music, but I also play a range of other things. You know, I play reggae, I play a mixture of, you know, what I'm, we might call neo-funk Af African music, you know, uh, like some of Shade stuff and all that stuff. And, you know, I kept looking for a more wider, more diverse um, audience, you know, and, I, you know, in this process, I would attract and add different musicians to to the team you know some people from america you know some um caribbean folks some south americans i was you know trying to get the right mix of of sounds from the musicians and this continued um 
until things really started opening up, you know. Um, we got a, a regular, a few regular spots we were playing at, and some of them actually lasted more than a year where we were resident um, musicians every Friday or Saturday night. Nice. Um, yeah. So then do, do you think for the, I don't want to say the regular musician, because I don't know if there's such a thing, but if you're not touring, you know, the type of musician who's touring and you're more local, you think uh, having venues that cater to the type of music that you play is a challenge in order for you to really move forward in your professional life? It, it is, especially if you're doing music that's not quote unquote mainstream American music. In DC, um, the, the hardest working or the most, the guys who work the most musicians are jazz musicians, mm -hmm. you know? DC supports jazz a lot, mm -hmm. you know? And if you do anything that is non quote unquote intellectual, you know, they have these ways they frame it um, supposedly jazz is the most intellectual and then everything else is BS, you know, <laughs> under that, you know. But that's, that's DC. That's DC, yeah. yeah. You know, and this being our home base, it, was, it wasn't easy, you know, to find uh, the right kind of venues that would, um, you know, not just give you a chance to play once, you know, you, you play once, you get 15 people out, and, you know, most club owners, restaurant owners know, yeah, it's just your first time, you know, keep going. But some will be like, mm, yeah, I was expecting 25 people, you're short 10, so sorry. <laughs> I'm like, give me a break, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. um, but that went on for a little while um, until it, it really became clear that um, we had something to offer musically and um, we started getting much better opportunities. And they weren't necessarily only in African uh, spaces, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because when, when uh, you know, speaking of African music, I mean, the term is so broad. Um, even within African music, there are different types of music, sure. right? Sure. Yeah. So in DC, how the, because right now African music is trending. We all see that, yes. you know, everybody's yeah. into Burna Boy, Angelique Kijo just won the Grammy, and I don't know, countless other people are well known around the world, you know, and under this category of Afro bits. Yeah. But um, how was it when you started the interest in, in African music? W was it there or is just something? <laughs> is it just something that came with time as it became more popular? Or how did that work out? It wasn't there. I remember those days I would mention Fela's name. They'll say, who? Okay. You know? People had no clue what I was talking about. I remember doing a, a gig at um, ah, a really popular jazz place. I forget the name now, but it's an iconic jazz spot in DC that's no longer there. And after this show, it was very well received. We did two shows actually back to back. And I remember it was particularly well received because um, there was some kind of event going on. Some speeches were made. I forget the exact event. And some speeches were made. And then the DJ starts playing, you know, the background music before we started to play. Mm -hmm. And my band came in playing the same thing as the background music was playing. And this freaked out people. They were like, uh-oh. All right now, you know, there is, and we took the song and we just made it into, right on the spot, we just made it into our own thing and flowed with it and then did our performance. At the end of that show, an African-American guy walked up to me and said, hey man, you're all good, you're cool. I'm going to tell you the truth. Ain't nobody want to hear African music in D.C. I'll be real with you. Really? Just like tell that? Tell me that straight up, just like that. It's like, yeah, this town is go-go and jazz, man. That's that's about it, man. That's that's what DC is about, go-go and jazz. Yeah. I'm like, well, sorry to say, but you're gonna see me around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Wow. Yeah. So, so we, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, that, it was, it was, it was a bit of a shock, but I was so high on the performance and feeling so good that I, I resolved in my mind that that was not going to be a stumbling block for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because uh, being an artist, it's all about introducing people to things, to things that they may not know they want to hear, right? Uh, in this exactly. case, we're talking about music. So, exactly. yeah, and educating people on this is what exists. Let, let me show you. Let, exactly. Right? Yeah. And this, bringing them along. Exactly. This was at the Bohemian Cavern. I, I just remembered. Bohemian Cavern was, is a huge jazz, you know, everybody who is jazz in D.C. has played there and bigger jazz names. And they gave us a shot. It was cool. They gave us a chance. We did well. They brought us back several times, you know, over a period of years, you know. Um, but it was not, you know, in a strange way, that always stayed on my mind. And in my, in my early days, I was a lot... <laughs> if you accuse me of bullish arrogance, you would not be wrong. <laughs> I developed a bit of a Teflon attitude because of the environment, you know, and also because I was a band leader, I needed to keep my band members um, feeling good. So if we got treated funny, you know, I would just wipe my feet off the doorstep of that place and keep on trucking. And I let my people know we're done there. And I meant it. I stood by it and, you know, because I needed to show that you know, there's, there's a, a goal and none of this other politics was going to affect us, you know. Mm -hmm. So then over the years, people became more receptive of uh, African music. And from what I know, um, as people as, was it, I can't remember if it's Mori Kante, but you know, as big names, were coming to DC, they became a bit more acquainted with African music. So would you say that that also played a role in people being more receptive? Absolutely, there was a huge spot, well-known spot called Kilimanjaro back in the day that um, you know was awesome African music every weekend. I mean, everybody went there. Lots of Africans, but lots of Caribbean people, lots of African-Americans and the DJs, you know, it was a DJ spot mostly but every now and then they would have, you know, like a Mori Kante, uh, or Fra you know, Franco, I remember, you know, they would have a few big stars come through and it was, you know, always memorable, always a fantastic time. And then also simultaneously Afrobeat had begun to make some En-Roads, not on radio, but in the clubs and the, in the spots, you know. So I remember Femi Kuti started coming to DC from those early days. He would play at the Lincoln Theater. And, you know, he would come once every two years. And then you could see he started coming every year, sometimes a couple of times a year. And you could see that African music was beginning to um, get better known in the, in the clubs. Never on the radio. I don't think I ever heard African music on the radio, except for WPFW. Okay. Where they had uh, they had this brother doing a, a Friday night or Saturday night show, a Ghanaian brother. Uh, no? It, Who? Is it Frank? Frank's show? No. Kofi, yes. Kofi Kosi Compre. <laughs> i never okay. forget. Yeah. Yeah. That was the early days of PFW. Oh. Um, yeah, he would play sukus all night long or high life. All night. It wasn't very diverse. He just played one thing that he liked and that, that was it, you know. But slowly, you know, people started to appreciate more live African music coming to town. And I have to say, I, I don't mean to distinguish African music, or pass it up, but uh, the... The North African style has always been a DC thing. You know, it's weird. Yeah, that North African sound from Mali 
um, Algeria, Tunisia, has always been appreciated by some of the venues. Um, and I've heard people say to the, to the listeners of our white brothers and sisters, that's a lot more palatable to the blues. Okay. And, and so, you know, they got into that orchestra, Baobab became a thing in DC. That sound, that, you know, rumba style and blues sound of the guitars and the twanging, they always liked that in mm -hmm. DC. I think that, I think you would hear that from time to time. Yeah. So then, because people were accustomed to one type of African music, and I mean, Africa not being a country, there are like right, right. so many different ones, then that was a challenge, right? Introducing them to Huge. something else. Huge, because it was too aggressive. They, they, it scared them, I'll be honest with you. I, I would do some shows and the energy would come out with and, you know, you would, you would, you know, people were taken aback a little bit. It kind of, you know, it's too heavy. It was too heavy. And, you know, some of the songs we picked, you know, doing some fella songs, where the lyrics were not yeah. kind to what, you know, to somebody who is a, a Western, yes. you know, um, we're superior kind of person. The music was not kind to them, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it didn't help help us. But, you know, that was what I wanted to play. That was what the band wanted to play. And, um, you know, we just went with it. And speaking of the band, so is this uh, the M.A. and Eteru? No, actually, or my first band was Union Street Band. That's actually, Union Street Band probably is even more popular than M.A. and Eteru. Union Street Band got to a point in D.C. that it really became pretty well known it was known as a band for the collective you know i had americans i had caribbean folks i had african folks in the band and um we had really fantastic residencies um all over dc at the time and we used to pack some spaces um i would play a range of so still African. I mean, that's the thing that was so amazing to me because people didn't realize that all the music we were playing was African. It was just, it was just not what they thought was African music, the heavy thumping and all that. But we only mm -hmm. played a lot of original work, but a lot of covers too, okay. that were still very much African, you know? Uh, but maybe, maybe we're a little jazzier, a little bit more soulful. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it really started getting popular. Um, and then, you know, I went through some musical changes as a person um, and before I changed up the name and, you know, moved on from a few musicians and then formed a man hetero. And what does hetero mean, or if anything? Sure, yeah, hetero is actually, it's, it's, um, is het heru. Het heru is the feminine aspect of heru, the Egyptian god. So um, one of the most important things I did when I reformed my band was to have a presence, the female presence, as not just an occasional thing, because that's how we used it in the other band. Occasionally we'll have a female singer here and there. But I wanted to make the female, the feminine, a big part, you know, a fixture mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, so Heteru was, you know, kind of a perfect um, way to blend that because I, not just because it's the feminine of Heru, it was also the, the goddess of music, of love, of uh, community um, and fest festivity. So, yeah, beautiful. yeah, yeah. 
So it's about balancing the masculine and feminine energies. If we're talking about it's, it's stuff. yeah, it's about being being oneness. You know, when there's too much of one or the other, things are out of whack. And I could tell from my previous band experience that yeah, things it's not necessarily always the best thing to have all masculine energy all the time, you know. Well, you're on to something there, brother. <laughs> Definitely. And I mean, with this band, you've, you've performed at the Smithsonian. You've done, oh, goodness, Africa Underground, I believe it was called, right? At the Smithsonian. Yeah. You've done the sound TV series, you've, original yeah. works, and all sorts of things. When did you initially yeah. start? Um, with this new band, I think we started in 2000, mm, 2012. Okay. Yeah, 2011, 2012. Um, I met um, my co-workers, um, Joy, um, beautiful singer from the D.C. area, and Elle, yeah. who's um, from Ethiopia um, background. And, um, you know, it became, we, we clicked. Um, I love the, the expressive, joyful, playful stage presence. I actually met Elle first. Uh, I did a performance. I sat in with a band at Bossa. And, um, you know, she was dancing that night and she was, you know, woo you know, <laughs> letting it hang. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I checked her out and, you know, we started working together. Joy uh, joined in, and um, it was really the energy I was looking for. Not a diminutive, demure female energy. I wanted a loud, funky, you know, I'm here, mm -hmm. female <laughs> energy. You know, I wanted to be able to just sit in the cut with the band grooving and let them do their thing. And then when it's time for me to do my thing, I do my thing. You know, I really wanted that um that back and forth and bring do the thing they do i've seen them yes, <laughs> beautiful yes. singers and beautiful presence as well that's yeah. right so outside of um the band you do countless other things <laughs> right uh <-huh. laughs> you wear many hats um sure. the radio show yeah in one of them how did that come about that's interesting. You know, I did, before the radio, um, and some of the difficulties we had with venues, I decided to become an event producer, okay. you know, because I was like, you know what, I've done studio, I learned how to work in the studio, I've done the band thing, I, I, I run the band, I play, I write, um, but I'm always like, Telling people, hey, can you book me? Can you? I'm like, that's not the way to, why should, you know, why should, is my life like this? I said, you know what? I'm going to go into event production. I'm putting together shows that I can perform in and I can invite others, you know? So um, we went into that and I remember I put together a proposal for the Smithsonian uh, for their 50th year anniversary. Um, and hey they loved it and the proposal was to uh, showcase 30 African and other musicians on one stage all day wow. it was a huge undertaking you know um, the first part of of that obviously was just to get the sign up from the Smithsonian which was not easy because finances were involved and all that. And then the second part of it was reaching out to the musicians. And then the most difficult part of it was actually creating a musical set list that could involve everybody, even those that are not African, right? Yeah. And still give the crowd a good time, you know? So we reached out to some rockers like Sitali, COA, who is a, a Zambian, US born musician. He's a rocker, he plays rock, you know, and some soul, you know, soul rock. 
we got him involved. So I'm thinking, okay, what sounds, what songs are we going to play with Sitali that are rock? I had to go search for that. Then we reached out to Gogo family, you know. Over the years, I'd made friends with some great Gogo musicians, Juju, Matt Miller, Juju on drums, you know, powerful Gogo drummer. He's actually the drummer on Grace Jones, you know, a couple of albums from Grace Jones, the Grace Jones. And uh, they were like, oh my God, we would love this. So I had to find music that would work for them too. Um, Navasha Daya, who's like, uh, at the time was a Baltimore based ball of energy, just raw soul, you know, and we had to get her in. So we had to find music that would work for that too. And of course, our regular, our African musicians who were around, some are Cameroonians, Nigerians, Kenyans. Uh, so we had to put together lots of, of music that not just everybody could play, but would enjoy playing. And that's, you know, over the years, I've gotten to know Michael because his band used to come and rehearse in my house in the early days, Chop Teeth. And I actually performed with Chop Teeth for about a year before I left them as well. Um, but um, I went to Michael, I was like, hey, this opportunity just came up. You want to help? And he was like, yeah, man, sure. You know, what does it entail? So I gave him the whole plan. This is how we want to work it, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, he dove, dove in. We started having meetings with the musicians, laying out the plan to them, giving them the music to go learn. You know, some of them never really played African music before, but you know, we, we got them involved, rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And um, so the show went extremely well. We had a, almost four hours of live music featuring 30 musicians at the Smithsonian Pavilion to a packed audience. Four hours? Almost four hours. Wow. That's and we were, yes, we were substitution, substituting musicians. So the first crew played, and a second crew took over, and then a third crew, then we'll introduce different elements. So this, this was like a web of things to coordinate. Mm -hmm as well as perform, because I actually performed myself too that day. Wow, you know? that's amazing. Yeah. So, so this, it was a lot. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, no. no. So this is how um, the idea for the radio show then came after yes. you and Michael worked on this big project? Exactly, after uh -huh. the success of that project, you know, we said, you know, what else can we do together? And, um, an opportunity. I'd already been tinkering with the radio show. You know, I, after I started, you know, my experiences with the venues and all these limitations we were running into and doing events, I said, you know, radio is next. Let's get something going. That way we can really grow our own audience. It didn't quite take off then, but when I connected with Michael, the idea came back up again. Uh, we tinkered around for a bit until the opportunity in Takuma Radio came up and they were like, why don't you guys audition or check out this opportunity? And uh, so, yeah, we did that. So just a note, Takuma Radio being a community radio, they actually That's look right. for content creators and different um, types of, what would you call it, programming, right? That's right. For That's their right. audience. That's okay, right. and this has been going on for how long now? Four years. Four years this month. I think uh, July 14th or 13th will be our fourth year. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Going Thank strong. You. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, because you can um, plug, right? Let's plug it. Uh, you, can, <laughs> <laughs> you can listen to uh, Jolly Papa on Takuma Radio as well as you have an app, right? Yes, yes. We also have our own app. Um, you can find out on jollypapa.com, um, but we're on w, uh, WWD 94.3 FM every Wednesday from 1 to 3. And the app, the station on the app runs 24-7, and we do a noon show yeah. on weekdays, yeah. That's great. 
when was that yesterday i was listening to on my way i was driving and listening to the app it's like oh and one of somebody i really enjoy listening to carrie's photo she came out he's like, oh. <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's so great because I, I love listening to it because of the great diversity you know it's not just music from africa but like you, you say on there it's also beyond which which means the diaspora yeah. so there's always some new musician that i'm discovering that's how i learned about biology and others you know so Wonderful. keep doing it it, it awesome. i really enjoy it and i'm sure that other people enjoy it as well fantastic thank you thank yeah, you yeah definitely so you've also done other events one of them being one of many perhaps having the great josh Colline host you know host an event for him yeah. what is how did you get to meet josh Colline and how's that relationship like and what have you done with him that's a great question so at the early days of the radio show, the, the founder and the general manager came to me and she was like, you know, every now and again, Afropop, first of all, Afropop comes on right after our show. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to Afropop on that station, the introductory voice is my voice. And, you know, she really loved the ease with which, because I think I, I did that in one take. It was just like, read this, boom, boom, it was done. And she said, you know, from time to time, Georges Collinet is not available. Do you want to do Afropop? You know, I thought about it for about a week. And I, I came back to her, I said, no, I don't want to do Afropop. She says, really? Afropop? Yeah, she says, you don't want to do Afropop? I said, no. I don't really want to do Afro pop. And she's like, why? I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable doing what we do. I like what we do. Afro pop is pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. I like the live vibe we bring, you know? Um, so she didn't let up though. Mar Marika is her name. She didn't give up so easily. So, uh, every now and again, a couple of times a year, the station does a fun drive. So she says, hey, guys, how about having George sitting for one of the fun drives? I'm like, yeah, OK, I, I can dig that. You know, that's cool. I like that. I said, plus, that will be bringing George Collinet into our world of live mm -hmm. right there. We pick the song, it's on. Pick the next one, it's on, you know. And so she introduced us and um, he came in a few days after that and we did the show together and it was super successful. I think we probably raised some of that in the highest numbers for a single show that first time, I think. Um, and the chemistry was just perfect. It was so good. He brought his music with him and introduced us to a lot of stuff and we introduced him to a lot of stuff too and he was like okay now I'm, I'm digging this you know um so we became friends and friendly went he invited us over to his house you know we've been over to his house a few times and um then i realized you know something weird is going on you know it's like there's no real um there's no real connection of the African community, musical community, to Georges Collinet, who's been doing this music thing forever mm -hmm. and is responsible for introducing so many African artists to the mainstream or, you know, trying mm -hmm. and doing a good job. So it dawned on me that something needed to be done, you know, to celebrate him, celebrate his contribution and um you know pay respects it's better to do it when people are here than when, right. when they're not so um there was some opposition but i pushed ahead i didn't let anybody deter me and i was like yeah we're gonna we're gonna get it done and uh we did and it was a, a really good time and of course we you know we've done a lot of things since that uh that event with him and 
I think we plan to do more. Great, great. So let's talk about um, the, again, going back to live music and everything. Do you yeah. all, outside of uh, live music, do you all also record CD, you know, like if somebody wanted a CD by MA, MA and the band, do you do original well, works? We do original works. Um, we put out singles. I, we don't, uh, you know, I haven't had the good fortune to complete a full length album yet. And okay. that's mostly um, on my part, you know, um, the recording process, um, it's not easy when you don't have, when, you know, when you have to shell out a lot of money each time for each recording and you don't have a space to like have the whole band come in and it's, it's difficult to coordinate. But over the years, we've done singles, we've put out singles, we've done, you know, events to release singles. Um, and then even Mike and I did an album two or three years ago. Oh. Um, which is on that Jolly Papa and uh, DC High Life Stars, which is another band we started uh, together. So that's like a combination of his band and your band, or is no DC High Life Stars is is basically the super African musician super band, the guys who play for touring artists Ooh. when they come and they don't have a band. There are some really special heavy hitters in this town that people don't really know much about uh, because they're always on tour or, uh, you know, they're producing, they're not really, they don't have their own bands, they're not playing in local venues a lot. Um, but we picked some really high quality super band members, true and true experienced guys. Um, and we said, you know, Mike has a huge band. I have a huge band. We're like, we want a smaller out, excuse me, outfit that is really tight, versatile. Um, and it would enable us to perform in places that may be difficult to bring a huge band into. Mm -hmm. And so, so we picked a few guys, Ari Zugdule from Cameroon and you know Joe Mulian also from Cameroon um Tanash Henri Tanash from Cameroon um Emmanuel Blackwell versatile drummer from Ghana who plays with the uh, one and only OJ Okemode when he's on tour and um the other guys when one person is not available we go for the same caliber, guys who just know their job. There's not, not a lot of talking. This is the song, they know the song. Because one of the things about being a band leader in DC, playing African music, is you find you have to teach a lot. You have to teach musicians who don't have the experience of playing African music. You have to teach them the music and make them comfortable. So it was good to just have musicians who just know the stuff and are just ready to grind it anytime they're called, you know, and that's why we put together DC Highlight Stars. Okay. Now, when you talk about uh, teaching people African music, yeah, from a novice standpoint, isn't it just music? Like no. what, what a... <laughs> What are the yeah. differences? I, I guess there are some subtleties to African music that may not be found in other types of music. There are, there are nuances that, you know, somebody might hear music, they get the chord structure, they know the key signature, they know the movement of the song and they can reproduce it, but they don't have the nuance. They don't understand that there's a slight delay here, but there's a small hole back there. Or there's a swing. It's a swing, some parts of the song that you have to, you know, play along with maybe not even the whole drum, but maybe just the hi-hat of the drummer. You have to like lock in with that hi-hat and swing with him and not listen to everything else. Just focus on that thing. So we have to show and teach these nuances. Um, it's just like in reggae music, you know, you see a reggae drummer, you know, he's just playing drums. No. 
that reggae drama is playing a one drop, but it's also slightly behind the bass player. So it's, it has a, a pushing effect. It's like it's pushing. And that's what reggae does. It, it pushes you along, you know, you get that notion to move in a certain way, you know? So the musicians who just never really have much experience playing African music, um, they would just come in and, oh, this is the chords and this is the tempo. No, 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 no. Let's listen again, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah. And some some people don't actually. I wouldn't lie to you. Some people never hear it, but some people when they get it, they're like, "Ah, now I see what you were saying. There's a little swing here. There's a little delay here. There's a little this the energetic thing here, and then you pull back. You know, all those things make a difference. Wow. So it's uh, it's really about learning and feeling and listening with your whole mind body and spirit really it you really know, is it. it really is i have a saying when i listen to people who comp african music who are not african i can tell the ones who listen to african music when they are not playing not many non-african musicians who play african music actually listen to african music as part of their day as part of their life you know they play it they're part of bands, but you can tell they don't really listen, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't force anybody to, you know, but you can tell the difference. True. So this is, um, it's interesting you bring that up because it sounds like there's also, you know, when we were talking about community earlier, you know, as part of bringing that community together, you must it sounds like live, breathe, and everything else, African music, in order for you to truly perform it to it, to the best of your ability. Is that right? That's correct. I think in music in general, but you know, um, you know, before I got into playing African music as a thing, um, I, I, of course, I listened to it, but I also listened to every, everything else. I listened to a lot of reggae, a lot of soul. Uh, for, for me, as somebody who really just loves music, period, I started to see where the intersections are between all these different things I'm, I was listening to. Um, but you're absolutely right. You have to immerse your entire being into it. You know, you literally, um, you know, I, it, it's weird because I, I never assume I know. I always try to approach it with a fresh ear uh, because I always find that there's something new to catch. There's always, I like all the songs I play on the radio, I play them over and over. And every time I play them, there's something, something new that I didn't, maybe didn't pay attention to the last time that is so obvious to me now that I'm listening. Oh, wow. Why didn't I catch that before? You know, it could be a little bell here or, you know, whatever. But you have to be immersed in, in the music to get that out of it, you know. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so we, you know, we're going towards the end here. Where do you, where do you see African music, or rather the future of African music, live music in the DC scene in, you know, post-COVID? Because let, let's put, let, let's push ourselves forward a little bit. What do sure, you sure. The future? I think it's, it's bright, you know, um, I've been running into the, you know, the radio show has given us a chance to meet a lot of young up and coming artists in the DC area. Um, trying to encourage them to do live music more than just studio production. And many of them are open, um, we're here to support them, you know, we're trying to make things available for their use, other musicians who can play along with them. Um, but I think the future is, is bright. African music in general has made such a huge resurgence um, with some of the new sounds and the new vibes. And people don't really understand how diverse and how big the continent is. I play every week. I do the radio show 
95% of the song I select are from a brand new artist from Africa, from the diaspora. 95%? That's huge. Think about that. That means that not only am I not repeating artists, first of all, I'm not repeating songs a lot, number one, but I'm not even repeating artists a lot. Yeah. There's so much African music out there. There's so much music from around the world that play, pays homage to Africa. And if you listen, you will find it. And some of it will shock you because you're going to be like, this is, these are Africans? Yes. Yes, they're Africans. They're, they're writing and telling their story. They don't need your help anymore. There was a time, <laughs> there was a time African music, you needed a sponsor to get into the scene. But this generation of artists don't need anybody's help. I tell my colleagues in radio, and I, just listen, let them tell their story. It's one thing if you don't connect with it, that's fine. But, you know, there is no right mark. It's storytelling. Right. Okay. Storytelling, being a jelly, the grill. Being the grill. You have right. to allow people um, to tell it the way they tell it, you know. that We just talked to Wumi today who... Um, it's just a tremendous artist. Um, she's a dancer, singer, creator, fashionista, and everything. And she started off dancing for Soul to Soul, you know, that uh, popular band in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see how she evolved um, performing on three continents but still with the essence of African energy behind what she does. And today I was asking her, you know, what, how do you describe your stuff? She's like, oh, I, I hate being in a box, you know, because this is, this is the, that's like the, the, the little handicap. Once you accept a box, then they might put you in that ridiculous thing they call world music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've had the, a discussion about world yeah. music, right? It's a very ridiculous category, you know? Of course it's world music. It's in the world. Where else was it alien music? <laughs> yeah, because your band has been described as, I, I saw here, Afro Roots, Afro Fusion, and all sorts of things. So it just, is it oh, all I, African music or is it like a subcategory? Maybe people need a, uh, um, they want to define things to make sense of those things, perhaps. I don't know. Well, yeah, that's it. But I think the main reason why it was called music is it's a polite way of saying non American music. You know, right. they didn't want to, they didn't want to give it a, a nasty label, you know, so they call it world. But it's just a way of saying, okay, this is non-American or non-European or whatever, you know. This is from the rest of the world out there. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people right. describe describe uh, African music as folk. Yeah, it's so folky. I'm like, God punish you. <laughs> Right, thunder fire you, right? <laughs> thunder fire you. <laughs> That's funny. Right, so it's, it's music. Just enjoy it, right? And it comes from Africa. It. it has roots in Africa. Just enjoy it. Everything has roots in Africa. True. <laughs> True. So, um, w we can let you go, or anybody actually without really asking and, and with everything that is going on in the world, you know, especially here in the US, ah, related to the death of uh, George Floyd and other African-Americans, um, 
One thing that I've been thinking about is the intersection of arts and activism, you know, and where the artist fits within that picture. Sure. Well, what are your thoughts on that, like at the intersection of arts and activism? Very important question. What the driving force for all this, you know, painful experiences we're having is at the root of it is fear. And with fear comes anxiety. Yeah. Music has a special role to play because music can cut through fear and introduce people to things that they don't know. They've, you know, they've put at a distance at arm's length from themselves. Music, musicians and music, uh, musical works are ambassadors of humanity. Mm -hmm a means, an art, to introduce humans to each other in a safe, fun environment and atmosphere. So musicians have a very important role to play. I even don't mind the booty shaking guys, musicians. Let's all booty shake. It might be good for us, you know? At the end of the day, you know, if I booty shaking with somebody from, you know, the other side of the world, they may not see me so strangely after that. Yeah. You see? So this is why I think m music in itself is activism. If it is used in the proper uh, way, because it introduces people to each other. It allows people to have their guard down and just participate, enjoy, you know, a time, five, ten minutes, half an hour with each other. You know, it's such an important thing. So, you know, I'll just say to musicians, keep on, I don't care what you produce, what kind of music. You know, people say, oh, this is a, you know, immoral, just tell those people to go and sit down because they need to understand that if what you're doing is bringing people together, it cannot be immoral. Mm. You know, you, you're, if you're singing about some sexual, we all have sexual things in our bodies. So, you know, put that aside. You're bringing people together you're, you're giving people the opportunity to buy drinks for, you know how many places I've been after doing a set, somebody, hey, let me buy you a drink, man. That's, my job is done, done. Because what follows after they buy you a drink is a little conversation. Right. They get to know you, you get to know them, you know? Uh, so m musicians, are on the forefront of human relations because we know that race is not a reality. Mm -hmm. Race is a man-made thing. And when you cut through all that nonsense, it's just human to human. Right. And the most important way is for humans to relate to each other. And music does this beautifully in the least confrontational way. Even Fela was non-confrontational. Fela will first start off with storytelling. You know, he'll tell you a little story before he hits you hard with the politics, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you see? So it, it's, it's the best way to end this strife that we're in. Because that's the only thing that dissolves this ridiculous notion of race. Race is not a reality, you know. Right. It's, I refuse to accept it as a reality. On either side, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a thing. It's just made up. Right. So culture, art and culture being a soft diplomacy in a sense, right? Because people have their guards down. Exactly. People have their guards down. You know, I've had lots of people of different 
kinds of people from different parts of the world step up to me and ask me questions. That song, what was that lyric saying? You looked so joyful. What I didn't understand. Tell me what that lyric was. I'm, I'm, you know, that's ambassadorship. That's human yeah. relations right there. Absolutely. You know, so if, you, if anybody who's involved in the art, please, your work is so needed now. You are, you are the bridge to the peace we all seek. Yes. Don't let anybody talk you out of what you're doing. Right. Great words of wisdom from Emmy. <laughs> Thank you for that. So before we go, where can the people find you? Online? Or... Yeah, um, jollypapa.com for sure. You can check us out also. Um, Emmaheteru.com. Uh, okay. uh, we are on Facebook, uh, Instagram, I, I think also, and uh, Twitter. So, you know, we're here and there. And uh, you know, drop a line if you find us. Just say what's up, or hit you, you know, hit you back. Okay, and all the links will be, of course, included at the end of this video. So, Emmy, thank you so very much. Time just flew by. It it you was know? a great pleasure speaking with you. The pleasure is mine, Claire. I enjoyed it very much, and keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, you got our full support. Thank you. I look forward to perhaps spending some time with uh, Jolly Papas in the future. <laughs> awesome. We would All love right. that. Fantastic. All right. All right. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings. Thank you. All Dance with us, dance with us, dance with us.